Good morning, and you're very welcome to this uh, session of uh, the UK Trade and uh, Business uh, Commission. Um, today, we're uh, going to be uh, looking at, at food uh, and also at, at Northern Ireland. Um, and we have uh, some uh, very key uh, witnesses. Um, and I'm going to start off uh, with uh, by asking our, our witnesses to give themselves uh, a, a quick introduction, uh, both to the commissioners and uh, to those who, who are, are, are watching this session. Just to give you a wee update of, of where the, the format of this is, there are several questions that will be asked by, by different commissioners. Each of the commissioners will have seven minutes uh, um, to ask all of their questions uh, and also for you uh, to uh, respond. Um, we're very grateful that you could make it today. Um, we're very grateful uh, for her answers that, that uh, to the questions that we're going to ask. Um, we would remind you to try and keep things as, as succinct as, as possible uh, to allow further uh, questioning if possible. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to start by asking you to introduce yourselves. So Emily, please first. Good morning and thank you very much for the invitation to be here with you today. So my name is Emily Rees and I am the Managing Director of Trade Strategies and a Senior Fellow with the European Centre for International Political Economy based in Brussels. Thank you. And Nick? Good morning everyone. <clears throat> my name is Nick Allen. I'm Chief Executive of the British Meat Processors Association. Uh, the British Meat Processors Association deals with beef, lamb and pork primarily and our members uh, would probably represent um, nearly 90% of the sort of pork production in the, sort of the country that, that gets sold, about 80 to 85% of the beef and about 65 to 70% of the, sort of the, of the lamb. Uh, our members will be involved in supplying the main retailers and both in importing and exporting. Thank you. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, William Bean. Good morning, Aidan. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks very much for the invite uh, to all members of the Commission. Uh, I'm William Bain, the British Retail Consortium's Trade and Brexit Advisor. Um, the BRC covers most of the groceries market in the UK, uh, including most of the major high street and corner shop uh, key retailers and names. Uh, we will later on be joined by uh, Karen uh, Goodburn, and when she does join, I will ask her to introduce herself. Um, but given time constraints, I'm going to head uh, straight into the questions. And the first question is from uh, Leila Moran, please. Thank you very much, Aidan, and thank you all for being with us. This is a really important session, I think. Um, the first question is just to help us set the scene. Um, which is, you know, if you wouldn't mind summarising the position now of UK food and trade drink, first with the EU, but then also globally. And I'll come to William, but then go to Nick and Emily afterwards if there's anything they'd like to add. William, can you help us? What's the scene at the moment? Uh, thank you, Leila. A very good question. Um, so overall, um, the UK has a trade deficit in terms of food and drink. Um, if one looks at the most recent... Uh, Pink Book, which is the, the ONS's um, annual publication in terms of uh, what is being exported and what's been imported and to where, um, then uh, the UK's deficit in food and drink was 24.3 billion in 2019. Um, the total value of food and drink exports was 23.6 billion pounds uh, in that year. Uh, which had gone up since uh, 2018. Um, cereals and cereal preparations had seen the biggest rise between 2018 and 2019. Uh, fish uh, was doing pretty well also, uh, and also meat. Um, in terms of where um, the exports are going to, um, it is primarily to the European Union. So if you look at uh, most quarters of where food exports are going, uh, around 60% is going to the European Union and around 38 to 40% uh, is going to the rest of the world. Um, in terms of imports, um, again, the pink book uh, kind of shows us that in terms of um, food and drink, um, you know, that trade deficit has been 
Um, static for the last few years, but if you go back to 2004, um, it has risen from um, around uh, 12.4 billion pounds in 2004 to double that now. Um, so I think that does demonstrate the reliance that we have in terms of imports. Um, if I can just say in terms of imports, primarily these are coming from the European Union. Um, so in terms of that food, uh, you're looking at around about 40% of food being imported each year uh, into the UK, which consumers uh, are buying and eating. Of that 40%, round about 80% is coming from the European Union. So I think the overall picture is that the vast bulk of our food and drink trade is indeed with the European Union. Thank you very much. Nick, have you got anything to add? Uh, yes, you're, and you'll forgive me if I just talk about my own specialist of areas, as so the, the the beef, lamb, and some pork area. Uh, and uh, the, I think the first thing to sort of say about the meat industry is it, it's fairly um, uh, it's a, it's an odd uh, in terms of a, a, a sector in that most manufacturing industries actually make something and they sell the whole product. We start with a, a a product and break it down and distribute it into wherever the sort of the markets or needs it. And and uh, we we have this uh, sort of car carcass balance um, as we refer to it. Uh, so there's uh, what that means is there's there's consumption at home here and our home consumers are, and cut parts of the animal that they're prepared to eat and other bits that uh, we export because there's a better value for them abroad. Um, so I, I sort of preempt that. So if, if you go through our self-sufficiency rates, uh, they don't sort of paint the whole picture because on beef and veal, let's say we're about 75% sort of self-sufficient. Um, lamb and, and mutton is a, is a really odd one because on the face of it, we're 100% self-sufficient and yet we actually export about a third of what we produce and we also import a third of what we, what, what we produce. And that's because of the seasonality and also because of this carcass balance issue in very simple terms uh we tend to eat the back end of the uh, of a, a lamb and the loins and the, the, you know we tend to try to export this to the front ends and the, and, and the cheaper cuts uh and in the pig meat sort of sector we're probably about sort of 53 to 55 percent sort of self-sufficient but that again doesn't tell the whole story because we actually import 60 percent of pork that we consume uh and we export about 30 percent of our production uh and increasingly so sort of china has been big sort of factor there but um uh but to go back to the sheep sort of trade the sheep trade is very much dependent on the european market Eight, 85 to 90 percent of their our exports on, on onto sheep uh on, on, of, of lamb would be into europe so it sort of you know europe is a significant sort of player for it um and um in terms of imports uh, most of our imports of beef tend to come from ireland primarily um, as our sort of close neighbor and our close production. I just, I don't, <coughs> I, poultry is my speciality, but we're about 77% uh, self-sufficient on sort of poultry. But again, there's an issue there in terms of that we export so quite a bit and import quite a bit because we, um, uh, of the parts of the chicken that we sort of tend to eat actually. But uh, so I think that gives us, a, <coughs> hopefully that gives you a brief sort of feel for what goes on on the meat side. Thank you very much. I'm so I'll go back to the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the next question then, and that's uh, from Dr. Philippa Whitford, please. Uh, thanks very much, Aidan. Um, my question is to Nick, and then I'll bring Emily and William in if they've got something to add. Now, Nick, as you've said, your expertise is in meat, but the issues are the same across the whole sector. My constituency contains both farming and fishing. And the impact on seafood, of course, has been really dramatic since we ended the transition period. Most of my fleet here in the southwest of Scotland were tied up in January, but even now it's taking up to three days to get produce to Europe and therefore both the sales and price are down. The recent DEFRA committee report is now calling on the government to seek a veterinary agreement so there are different models of that. To what extent could that reduce both the bureaucracy for businesses and reduce the delays at border checks? 
Uh, yes, massively. And, and in fact, actually, we put a report out uh, as, as an, our own trade association um, about two or three weeks ago. And one of the recommendations in that is, is a, a veterinary agreement should should, should be looked at. Um, uh, I, I am very aware of the fish side, and I think they've probably fared a lot worse than the, the, than the meat side. But undoubtedly, the um, the, for, for in terms of our meat trade with Europe, it very much going on. It was a 24-7 supply chain that we were supplying. And uh, basically, the now exporting, if we're lucky, it puts us all day. Uh, you know, sort of, you know sort of with a fair wind, you only have to, have to add an extra day. But it's unpredictable. You don't know whether your lorry is going to be stopped and pulled up to one side. The cost has gone up considerably. Most of our members will say it's put an extra thousand pound. It's doubled the cost of a lorry going through, um, uh, going through the sort of the ports. And that's before you take into account the army of uh, office workers that you have to have behind the scenes to produce all this paperwork together so it's an enormous sort of burden and without a shadow of a doubt some sort of veterinary agreement um, would uh, get rid of a lot of this sort of bureaucracy and it's one of the recommendations we made uh, and I think it, you know it's strongly recommending that um, uh, the Swiss model is looked at so closely because I, I think they, they have come to arrangement and that, you know, so they're, so they're not totally bound in by Europe does, but they have an arrangement with Europe, it seems to us, uh, where they can avoid a lot of the sort of veterinary sort of checks. And it seems to us something, a model that's worth examining. But uh, uh, we haven't probably quite suffered as badly as the, uh, the fish side, but undoubtedly, and some of our smaller uh, suppliers have actually, have actually given up. Uh, sending stuff so our, our exports are down considerably and the smaller ones are the ones that are really suffering here yeah. well i think that's the thing i mean farmers and skippers are small businesses and therefore they don't have uh, the army of staff but as you highlight talking about perhaps a swiss type veterinary agreement where there is more alignment i mean that would suit the kind of multiple small combined loads that we ship to Europe rather than the, the kind of New Zealand lamb where it's a container of one product that, that some people suggest. So one can reduce the bureaucracy and the cost of the paperwork. The other one just reduces the number of lorries that are stopped. Is there discussion going on at all do you, that you're aware of, of pushing for the one or the other? Uh, in terms of a negotiating a veterinary agreement, no, we're not aware that, uh, that there's anything sort of going on on that sort of front at all. And, and, and our, our feeling was that um, had we got to the point where Europe was having to sort of go through these, the, this bureaucracy that, that, that we've, sort of, um, we, we've now got when we want to export, then actually that might have brought everyone to the, uh, the table a sort of a bit quicker. But with the, with the delays, um, I'm not sure until the, the, the Europeans experience the same sort of system and the same costs and the same, uh, same challenges that everyone will have a will to sort of say, I, actually, maybe we should, uh, you know, sort of sit down and look at a different, um, different system. But I, I'm not aware of discussions going on around that as at all. But it's, um, but I think it was, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it would help immensely if they, if they could be advanced. Was it not the case that Europe offered one, but it would have been, if you like, that Swiss style that would have involved at least a degree of alignment and therefore didn't fit with the, with the UK um, aims at that time. That was certainly my understanding that Europe was open to one. I think it, to I think it probably, yes, I think it'd probably be good to bring Emily in here because she, she would be closer to actually what, what, what those sort of negotiations that went on than I would. Okay, thanks very much to you, Emily. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of great things said there. Um, Perhaps firstly, let's uh, remind ourselves why, why we are not yet discussing our veterinary equivalency agreements and other um, exchange of letters of the sorts uh, is simply because the trade and cooperation agreement was only adopted in the European Parliament yesterday. So uh, that really is the starting point. And, and that trade and cooperation agreement has a pretty skinny sanitary and phytosanitary chapter um, if we look in comparison to many other trade agreements. And that for the reason that has just been uh, mentioned, which is that there was a, 
uh, doubt as to whether the UK would um, go on a path of regulatory divergence in the area um, of its uh, uh, food safety and other hygiene regulations. Um, so when we look at the type of agreements that the EU has struck with other third countries, um, what we see is that they're rarely um, a, a one uh, uh, fits all, let's say, agreement. It's rarely a single document. It's actually a trust building exercise that happens over time and that is incremental. So we, 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 we make a move on, for instance, let's say um, on, on, on meat products, we test that out, we see if it works, and then we can go to the next step. But without that trust level, uh, in terms of uh, divergence of regulation, but also in terms of uh, import controls um, that are being imposed onto third partners, um, it, it really will, um, it does require a lot of uh, trust building. So I, I really would uh, stress that point if we're looking at how we construct these things. Also, they don't happen overnight. So if we take the case of the uh, EU New Zealand veterinary agreement, actually that's a series of decisions um, a series of decisions that were built nearly over a decade. So I think that we need to also um, acknowledge the fact that this um, uh, might take slightly longer than, um, than what uh, is, is currently debated. Okay, thank you. Anything you want to add quickly, William? Uh, yes, thanks, Dr. Whitford. I mean, it is very interesting that the regulatory relationship that we have on food is less close between GB and the EU than that which New Zealand has with the EU. Uh, I think that's a really important point. And what we're seeing at the moment is relative pragmatism in terms of what's happening uh, at you know, EU borders um, in terms of the incidence of physical checks um, of GB goods going in. But that's really only because the regulations are pretty much still the same at the moment. If we have divergence over time, you know, if, for example, the UK makes trade deals with countries which have a very different approach on SPS, we're going to see much more divergence and therefore much more checks. So the situation at the EU border could get a lot worse in the future uh, for GB goods. And I think that's a very important point. And, I think it re-emphasizes why a veterinary agreement is not just necessary for what the situation we face now, but for the situation which we could face in the future. It's also not just um, you know, reducing how many lorries get stopped at the border. It's still the case that if all the companies still have to do 40 pages of bureaucracy, then the cost uh, remains. Um, thanks very much. I'll go back to the chair now. Thank you very much, Philippa. Um, uh, the slight change to our scheduled programming, I'm going to go to uh, Paul Garvin, MP, now um, as he has to, to leave. So, Paul, I'll come to you for your question, please. Chair, thank you very much, and thank you for bringing me in uh, this early, uh, and uh, thank, thank the panel. Uh, really, I want to focus on probably the Northern Ireland, uh, as you can understand, uh, issue associated with the, the protocol and the probably the TSS uh, help that is supposedly there for business and the feedback that we're getting is that uh, it is not necessarily that efficient in actually helping business uh, access uh, and export uh, to, to such a degree where many SMEs are deciding not to uh, because of the bureaucracy that is being imposed upon them uh, and uh, that is a, an area where there is a problem but they don't feel that they're getting the help uh, 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 from the TSS and really we're looking at it from the food and drink aspect to, uh, between Great Britain and Northern Ireland which is a very a very difficult uh, uh, area because we seem to have more checks than are happening in any other part uh, of the United Kingdom, even between Dover and Calais. Uh, it seems that we are having more checks at the Northern Ireland sector uh, and border uh, than, than at the sea border that has been implemented and put in place. Uh, and that seems to be causing a problem. TSS are definitely uh, maybe not necessarily uh, making it easy for small business, but I'm asking you for your comments. And that's firstly to William probably. Thank, thanks very much, Paul. Um, I think it's important to consider that TSS was never going to be a silver bullet 
uh, for the Czechs and was never really intended to be. Um, what does TSS do? Well, for those companies who use a particular kind of uh, customs IT system, the customs declaration uh, system, CDS, which just rolled out from uh, January 2020, it can work for you. If you don't use CDS, however, you can't use TSS. Um, so that in itself exempts a lot, particularly, as you say, of small companies, uh, because CDS is very intensive in terms of your customs administration, the amount of detail you've got to put in, the number of data fields you've got to you've got to fill out uh, when you're making um, uh, the declaration. So C TSS can help with the initial declaration. It can help with the supplementary declaration, uh, which is made some period after the goods initially arrive. They can help with the uh, entry summary declaration uh, that's made in the safety and security de declaration is part of that. But of course, what they don't help with is if your goods are battable goods, uh, they can't help with that. They don't help with the um, SPS paperwork, you know, the certificate having to be mm -hmm. signed by the vet. Um, you know, thankfully, we don't have rules of origin, but in terms of the at-risk element about goods potentially entering the single market, then they don't deal with that part of it as well. You're looking to the UK Trader uh, Service to deal with that. So TSS just deals with part of the uh, part of the checks and part of the paperwork coming into Northern Ireland. I would say they have set up um, a UK um, Northern Ireland Trade Academy, which has been useful. So even if you're not going to use TSS because you don't use CDS, you use the older system chief instead to do your customs uh, de declarations. Um, there is still some benefit that you can get from at least being up to date uh, with all the things that you do have to fill out. So um, it's a part solution. It's not a holistic solution. I think over time, um, one can see the benefits of having a more holistic approach uh, with a sort of single gateway to deal with all of the paperwork and all of the checks that companies face getting goods from GB to NI now. Uh, and on the same question, could Nick maybe make comment because I appreciate that we have, a, we have a very close market between Northern Ireland on our agri-food end and between GB and NI as well, both ways. Yeah, and I, I have the luxury of representing a lot of members who've got um, companies in Northern Ireland or bases in Northern Ireland, and, and the, the movement backs and forwards has possibly been considerably easier for them than it has been uh, the, the smaller sort of traders. Um, but it, in terms, of, <clears throat> and it is, uh, you know, and I'm not at all surprised to see smaller businesses struggling with this. This is a monster of a system, <laughs> to, you know, to, to get things in place. Uh, in, in the report we produced recently, we also identified, you know, 29 sort of separate processes, you know, to, to, uh, to go through where beforehand there was, there was you know, hardly anything, anything at all. Um, so it's no surprise that the smaller companies are really, really struggling with it. It, it is, uh, um, uh, it, it is a nightmare to find a way through it. I think probably TSS has, have done their best to help in places, but as Williams has said, it's not the sort of silver bullet that was going to sort of help everyone. Um, and um, uh, I, th I just think it just epitomizes the 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 or demonstrates the, you know, just how complicated we we have created, you know, a uh, system sort of for ourselves really so um i haven't had so many uh you know sort of comments back from my members about whether tss has been so good or bad or not because most of them have been able to in a bit there's had the luxury of bypassing it for one reason or another um uh, and, and haven't been so dependent on it but i have picked up a lot of small but comments from a lot of smaller businesses that yeah have really been struggling with it and and they just walk away from it they haven't got the resources they can find the the the, the office staff to go and help them out and at the end of the day that they that we you know we've tried to help sort of some of the smaller ones but uh in the end they say well, i just can't do this you know so they, they walk away from it and that's really that, 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 that has been my my uh feeling as well because we have businesses that have been in contact with us to say that their suppliers from GB just feel that they cannot go through the process. They don't have the manpower or the additional uh, administration staff to actually allow this to happen. Um, uh, that, uh, that has been an issue. But 
I, I'm just wondering, that is on the basis of what we currently have, which is not what I call the full fat, uh, because we are on uh, going through a period where there have been relaxations and everything has not been implemented in its entirety. Uh, and when that does happen, uh, this is only going to increase. And I'm wondering if you're of the same opinion, because uh, if definitely the business is, and we as politicians are feeling that uh, full implementation of the protocol will uh, ultimately uh, be uh, a greater uh, hindrance to business and the growth of business in Northern Ireland. Yeah, to keep things short and simple, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> you, you know, yes, I, I just can't see how, uh, if they're not coping now, how they're going to sort of cope, cope sort of going forward, unless someone really gets a hold of this system and simplifies it sort of huge, hugely. But yes, if, if on the current course, it's not a good, uh, the prospects don't look good for smaller companies. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Chair. Thank you. And appreciate bringing me back in, for, in early. Thank you. No problem. Um, back to our proper schedule then. Uh, we go to uh, Liz Savile Roberts, please. Thanks, Aidan. Um, I think my question is about the checks and paperwork in place at present. Actually, we we, we have, you know, I wouldn't say we have a detailed uh, conception of it, but I think that's been quite described. So I'd like to go under the skin a little bit more with that. I and mean, we've been talking about what a veterinary agreement might resolve. But are there other issues in relation to the, the non-tariff barriers um, which which need to be resolved in other ways. Um, my background for this, obviously, is I represent a, a mountainous and a coastal uh, constituency in northwest Wales. So small carcass lamb is highly significant, beef as well, and I have a, a particular local interest in, in 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 seafood and shellfish. And it does seem that shellfish is being caught up with other issues in England and Wales to do with the the quality of water and how how that's measured, which seems to be different to how it's measured in Scotland. So I'm aware of that. But are there other issues here that we should be aware of? And is there variation across the different sorts of, of food produce, particularly meat and shellfish, that's going from the UK into the EU? Emily, first of all, please. Thank you very much. I mean, there's a lot there to, to unwind. So but perhaps, perhaps it's worth um, uh, keeping in mind what are the, the checks for SPS, right? So uh, the goods which are subject uh, to sanitary and phytosanitary controls are the ones that have that carry risk. Uh, risk for human health, so it's the food safety aspect, it's also the animal health aspect, because we don't want to be bringing in diseases, um, and it's also the plant health aspect, so we also don't want to be bringing in diseases that could um, uh, have an impact on our local production, right? Um, so those are essentially the elements that we look at. And so when we're looking at a veterinary agreement in the style of uh, the New Zealand uh, agreement, well, uh, you'll probably find quite a lot that, that uh, caters to lamb in that deal, but probably nothing on shellfish. So um, the, 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 the question of going in more itemized, if I if I put it that way, and, and looking at the very specific elements, you mentioned, for instance, water quality, that will be one that for bivalve mollusks will be important. Um, but also uh, questions of treatment prior to export. Um, th those are the, the different categories. Um, now, the, the way that what happens is that before the good is, is exported, you get the veterinary um, certificate uh, or a catch certificate if we're looking at, at, at certain seafood. Um, and then it's pre-notified into the Tracy's system, um, which I, I'm sure many of you are aware of, which is the trade and control and expert system, which now the U GB has got this new system called IPAFs, which is more or less the same uh, system as Tracy's. Um, and all these certificates need to be inputted into that system 24 hours before arriving at the border control post which is a, 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 the, the place where these goods can enter into the EU um, and will be checked on the basis of risk, which is where we get to the physical checks. So there's documentation check and there'll be a physical check. And in some cases, uh, laboratory analyses um, of uh, the produce, depending on the level of risk that it can present. Now, all of those um, uh, questions, so if we're looking at um, shellfish or eggs or lamb, will have very specific issues um, relating to the sanitary or the phytosanitary requirements. Um, and, and the easing of them will, will be quite specific to each item. So, which is why I've always recommended um, uh, quite an itemized approach, uh, sector per sector, even in some cases, product per product. 
And if I just ask one follow on question, Emily, um, again, if we, we, we've got our, our exporters are facing problems in the here and now. Yeah, we are beginning. It was, it was really pertinent that you mentioned that the TCA was only actually ratified in, in Europe, in the EU yesterday. But what could be done to alleviate the problems in the short term? So there are a number of things that can be done. Firstly, the, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement sets up a, an SPS committee under uh, the Sanitary and Phytosanitary Chapter. And that committee basically will bring uh, the official authorities on both sides to look at uh, specific areas uh, of trade friction um, and that can be resolved on either side. So you'll come with sort of uh, your, your negotiators will go in uh, with um, a, a list, let's say, of items where there are trade frictions and you'll try to resolve them over time. Um, uh, the, the frequency, obviously, of those meetings is quite important. Um, I'm not aware that there is a date set for the first meeting, but now that the, um, the agreement has been effectively uh, endorsed by the European Parliament, I'm sure that those um, committees will now um, start uh, their work. Um, believing that this will be resolved in the short term, I think, is is um, uh, wishful thinking in a way. I think these are, are issues that will take time. And so being strategic about the priority areas that need to be tackled um, uh, first is, is really uh, essential and that will be done on both sides. Obviously, considering that Great Britain isn't imposing import controls on European goods currently, the level of trade friction is currently higher from GB to EU than it is from EU to GB. So the list will be uh, a longer one on the British side. Which is an interesting um, negotiating position to be in. And also, of course, when the um, Secretary of State for DEFRA talks about a pragmatic approach rather than a, perhaps what we'd like to see a more organised approach. Um, William, if, if you could approach the same issue, but I'm also really interested in what you said about um, gradual uh, shifts over time. and. If you could comment on the here and now, but if you could give us some idea as best you can of how this could roll out over over forthcoming over coming years. Uh, indeed, thanks, Liz. I mean, to, to build on what Emily said there, um, um, you know, that was the picture in terms of the SPS part of the checks. Um, what you also have to have in terms of the general customs uh, paperwork is an initial declaration. You need to have an entry summary declaration as the goods go into the European Union. Again, this was a political choice which the government made. You know, the Swiss and the Norwegians have a different setup uh, whereby they had alignment with the Union Customs Code and it takes away the need for entry summary declarations in terms of goods entering uh, the EU. Um, so there's that which adds to the cost and complexity as well. One of the things that's really going to be unchangeable, um, given the fact that it's a free trade agreement rather than a customs union and single market mechanism, is the issue around rules of origin. Uh, that's something we have with GB to EU movements that we don't have in terms of GB to NI. Um, so, you know, these are causing considerable problems uh, with particular food products, partly around the issues of distribution. Um, so, you know, if, you're, if your cycle of product is EU to GB to EU, uh, then you have enormous problems now and extra tariffs uh, involved with that. So, uh, so rules of origin are not going to go away, I think, anytime soon. If the goods are vatable, there are also paperwork and checks that go along with that. And we've seen the e-commerce packages, indeed, some of them really being of, of food and drink products which have experienced considerable difficulty as a result of import VAT. Um, and then also if they're excise goods, you have those difficulties as well. Also in terms of goods that are um, being sent via transit processes, um, at least the UK government did sign up to the Common Transit Convention in its own right. But we have lost for many food products the advantages of being involved in the union transit scheme. Um, and that's also introduced extra cost, extra paperwork and extra complexity. Okay, thank you very much. Could I just have one sneaky quick question to Nick, please, Aidan, just forgive me. Um, well, the role of, uh, because I'm representing a, a constituency in Wales, 
what do you see as the role of the devolved governments and particularly bodies such as Habiki Kumri, you know, the, the um, Meat uh, Promotion Board in Wales? Yeah, I mean, they've got a difficult situation. The, the levy boards, were in front of, I met with them yesterday, in, in terms of where they can get involved, involved in. Uh, on the whole, they've been, we found them sort of, uh, you know, as supportive as they can be. But actually, this is, this is about legislation. I, I, th I think, um, I, I don't think the levy boards can, uh, you know, we, we're not looking to the levy boards necessary to, um, uh, as a key to here, you know, I, th I think the, the, the answers are more with government and uh, or, or the, the vast array of uh, agencies are involved in this to simplify the system. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now we'll go to Hilary Ben MP, please. Uh, thanks, Sir John. Um, I must say, Nick, prompted by your description of a monster of a system, which I thought was really striking, I wanted to ask Emily this question. Are the checks that the EU imposes in these areas um, more rigorous than other countries around the world? Just so we get a sense of how this compares with exports of food and agri-food products elsewhere. So imposing import controls uh, on the basis of sanitary and phytosanitary requirements is uh, very much uh, an international uh, requirement on countries, right? Um, so uh, the question of understanding whether they are uh, stronger or not very much depends on the regulation that you have in place uh, domestically. So it, it's much more a question then of, of, of wondering whether, you know, um, the level of checks required to ensure that the import uh, is in line with your domestic regulation is is the key here it's not whether it's better or or or, or more or less robust um if i could put it that way i mean a lot of these discussions tend to uh, focus on the question of um higher or lower standards and if you'll allow me uh to, to touch upon that that point i think that we often get the two things confused here. One, which is the process and production method, which is, for instance, the animal welfare standard, the environmental protection, even the labor conditions in which a, a food product is made, which is a technical barrier to trade uh, question, it's a TBT question, and sanitary and phytosanitary measures, which are there to ensure that food is safe to be uh, consumed um, and that we are keeping um, uh, our, our animals uh, safe as well in terms of health and our plants safe as well in terms of the entry of pests and diseases. Um, and, and so the, the level of checks that you're uh, going to be imposing will depend again on the level of risk. So for instance, if we're looking at right now questions relating to avian influenza or African swine fever, well, if you have occurrences of those diseases in certain countries, you might want to uh, increase the level of checks. That's a very um, standard way um, of, of imposing import controls on these um, on, on these goods and is um, you'll find quite uh, can be quite robust around the world not it's not specific to the European Union or to the UK that also has very robust uh, import yeah. controls uh, today on third country imports. Okay can I just pursue that question of, of risk with you because somebody might say well for food that is made in GB and is being exported to Northern Ireland um, it's still being produced to exactly the same standards it was being produced to on the 31st of December. So what is the risk currently? And it'd be helpful to try and understand what, what is the EU's answer to that? So perhaps if we if we we talk about risk and, and why we put in these import controls, I think that even in 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 countries with high production standards and that um, carry out, you know, um, production uh, uh, carefully, um, we still have for foodborne infections, for instance, or fraud. So um, um, we can recall, for instance, the E. coli outbreak in Germany or the, the fipronil in the eggs in, in Belgium or, or the horse meat fraud in, in France, right? These countries produce at a very high level uh, quality uh, um, uh, standard of, of quality of food. 
Um, in, in the same way, we, we, we impose the checks to make sure that the food that is being imported is safe. Now, uh, the, the question that you're raising, if I understand it correctly, is on the checks between GB and Northern Ireland. Well, from the moment that Northern Ireland is in a regulatory um, uh, alignment with the European Union, that means that you have a divergence of standards and regulations that is automatically um, happening. Uh, it happens now. Any decision that has been taken, for instance, um, uh, in the standing committee um, um, for, for plants, animals, uh, feed and food of the European Union uh, since January will have impacted the standards that should be applying in Northern Ireland. So it's that that we're checking. Um, if that answers right. the question. Right. No, it, it does. But there would be nothing to stop the UK choosing to follow that guidance insofar as it changes on the EU side, would there? Well, in that case, you would be choosing to remain to remain completely and fully aligned with the European Union's um, food legislation and feed legislation and any legislation in the area um, of uh, that affects uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures. Um, and my understanding is that that was um, not what uh, the UK pursued in the negotiations. So no. why would there be a turn now? No, that, I mean, that's a very fair point, though you, you, you could argue that there's a difference between, uh, I think the phrase is dynamic alignment, where you undertake automatically to do that. In other words, the EU decides what the standards are in the UK or the UK deciding voluntarily to do that because it it would avoid the problem that is one of the red lines that the government uh, put into the negotiations my my final question is about uh, the famous supermarket lorry full of thousands of items that is crossing uh, the irish sea because I, I take very much your point about some of those food scandals what is your assessment and, uh, of the degree of risk that any of the items in the back of that lorry going to a Sainsbury's or an Asda supermarket uh, presents a risk, firstly, of, of breaching the standards? And secondly, what in practice is the risk of any of those products entering the European Union, i.e. across the border into the Republic? So I think that there are um, there's there's one question which is risk, but there's also another very important question which is compliance with the importers' food regulations, um, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, effectively, if you're exporting to the European Union, your product must comply with the uh, regulation of the European Union, um, and that's why there are checks to make sure that indeed um, uh, the, the the food, uh, for instance, uh, qualifies under the safety standards of the European Union. Um, the, these requirements are placed on all uh, imports into the European Union, and in a way, if it were to um, uh, to, to not impose these checks on, on Great Britain, or um, you would find yourself in a, a situation where there would be uh, a discriminatory um, uh, advantage to British products in comparison to other third country products and that uh, raises issues of compliance at the world trade organization okay that that is really helpful thank you very much indeed thank you hillary now uh, a couple of quick questions from me and just to let you know after that i'll be coming to stephen Farry and claire hannah um so the first question for me is going to uh, Emily and William, please. Um, what checks were already in place uh, for products moving uh, from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and what is newly required under the protocol? And is there anything in the protocol which specifically helped reduce uh, those checks and paperwork uh, compared to exports to the EU? So a nice simple one to start for me. William first, if you don't mind. Uh, thanks, Aidan. Um, yes, well, I mean, the island of Ireland, um, in terms of public health emergencies in the past, for example, the foot and mouth outbreak in 2001 has always been treated as a single epidemiological area. Um, so there have been checks, for example, on the movement of live animals uh, from GB to NI uh, before Brexit was ever thought of and before the protocol came into being. Um, so, so those were already there. Um, it is not true to say there were no checks whatsoever uh, on all goods in all circumstances moving from GB to NI. 
Um, in terms of what's there in the protocol to, to reduce checks, um, well, bear in mind that, um, you know, the approach that's, that's taken is that, uh, you know, the onerous checks and paperwork are required in relation to effectively plants and products of animal origin. Um, so other goods that don't, don't fall into that category um, therefore don't have to be checked. Um, so it's not the case that, for example, electrical or industrial goods have to undergo checks. It's only about the most sensitive goods which potentially could offer um, the, the, the biggest risk um, to, um, uh, to, the, to the single market if the goods were traded into there eventually. Um, I think the big difference is that not having, um, uh, you know, tariffs uh, in terms of goods moving from GB to NI ordinarily. So the fact that we have a, a zero tariff, zero quotas deal, uh, that does mean that rules of origin, which we would have otherwise had to have complied with on GB to NI uh, movements of products uh, are not a factor here. Uh, we have got complexity, as no doubt we'll go on to later, in terms of, you know, goods which, um, you know, don't come within the UK trader scheme and might be at risk of entering the single market, but we don't have rules of origin. So it's the combination of the protocol plus the TCA uh, that at least has taken that out of it. I think it's also fair to say, Aidan, that the arrangements on VAT, uh, whilst they are tricky, uh, for goods which are vatable are perhaps not quite as bad as they could have been. Um, you know, there, there, there is a, 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 a slight difference there in terms of treatment in comparison with uh, some third countries to the EU. So, so there are some slight modifications there which have made compliance a little bit less onerous uh, than would have been the case otherwise. And Emily, please. I think I'll defer to the experts on the protocol uh, on, on that question, if that's okay, Chair. Okay, anything you want to add, Nick? <laughs> no, I, th I think um, I, I agree with William, actually. I, I think on, on the whole, it, it's helped. It's, it, it's, it's easier, and, and my members would sort of feel it's, it's easier to get things into Northern Ireland than it is into um into Europe, but uh, uh, but only just, <laughs> and and you know I still have mem some members that actually um, uh, are finding that uh, it's it's easier to go via Dublin to get something into Northern Ireland than it is to go straight into Northern Ireland. So, um, uh, but but now on the on the whole, I think it's made things a bit easier, and some of the things in there have have helped. But it's uh, um, but you know just on the on the UK sort of trader scheme, um, it's not without its owner aside. And some of my members would say that there's there's quite a bit behind the scenes, quite a bit of uh, paperwork and extra work that goes with that alone. So, okay. Um, again, an another one for me. To what extent are the checks on food going into Northern Ireland and going into the EU simply not meant for the situation in which there is a significant amount of trade by business of, of, of all sizes? I suppose the, the sort of comparison is uh, the New Zealand style where you have uh, very few commodities uh, with <laughs> uh, quite large uh, loads, whereas, uh, for example, in the in, in the, the in, in Northern Ireland border areas, you'd have about 7,000 small businesses that would cross, uh, and a lot of those would have food and drink. Um, so what what's your, your take on that? I'm going to go to Emily, then William, and then Nick, please. Well, um, thank you for that question. I think, I mean, once again, when we're going back to the SPS checks, um, as mentioned, every product is going to have to have its own um, health certificate. Um, and, and so a batch of products, sort of a multi-product consignment will need as many as many health certificates as there are uh, different products. Um, and each again will have to be pre-notified into Tracy's, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so obviously this increases the cost of uh, multi-product consignments um, and effectively makes uh, trading um, single products in bigger batches uh, the preferred way of trading. Um, unfortunately, there's not going to be 
um, a, a quick solution to this. And uh, we know that it will disproportionately affect uh, small and medium enterprises who would be, for instance, specialty foods. Um, uh, you know, it's the, the typical case of um, um, selling a, a couple of wheels of cheese to a, a, a specialist uh, a, a shop in the Netherlands, for instance. Well, your producer of those wheels might decide that it will be um, uh, of better value to sell them at a lower price within the domestic market rather than um, take on the costs of uh, having a certificate for three wheels of cheese. So uh, again, um, it's a very unfortunate situation in the sense that it does disproportionately affect SMEs and the bigger companies will be able to deal with these questions of, uh, of consignments and health certificates per consignments um, uh, much easier. Thanks, Emily. Just before I go to you, William, uh, Roger, you want to make a quick intervention? Thanks, Aidan. Something that's been emerging from the last session and now from this session, and Emily has just forcefully stated the case, is that there is a disproportionate impact, a very disproportionate impact upon SMEs. And it's quite clear that a small company may be taking part of a shipment in a lorry will bear a disproportionate cost. One lorry, one big company, one set of paperwork, one charge. 10 different companies, 10 different bits of paperwork, disproportionate costs. What proportion of the trade with the EU, the former trade with the EU, was small businesses as against what you might describe as larger businesses? Do you know? So I don't have the numbers on that, but I'm sure that somebody will be able to find them um, um, pretty rapidly. I think that what we're talking about here is that SMEs um, uh, have easier, um, have been used to, let's say, to trading within the customs union, right? Um, and that's essentially what SMEs generally um, flourish at. Um, and so they often don't have a lot of experience in the export process. Um, and so a lot of the work that we're going to have to do now in the years to come is going to be training up SMEs in the art of exporting. And um, often there is a, 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 a knowledge deficit when it comes to the, the rules and requirements. In that part is indeed, I would you could qualify a teething issue um, in the sense that there is a big process that will have to happen now in terms of training up SMEs but it won't uh, necessarily um, make a huge difference on the, the, the costs that, that have just been um, uh, listed, the costs of the, the certificates or, uh, for instance, the, the laboratory checks um, and so forth will continue to exist unless there is a, a, um, a solution found for that specific product once again. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Emily. Uh, back to the original question, uh, William. Uh, thanks, Eden. I mean, the the issue is down to the sort of scale of the different composite loads of products which are going over with thousands of product lines going over every day, um, hundreds of trucks moving across from Scotland or Liverpool to, to Northern Ireland uh, each week. And um, as a result, the issue isn't a question about, you know, what was signed up to and what needs to be done. Um, there shouldn't be any argument about what was signed up to. The protocol is very clear. The question is, however, how do you comply? And so that's why for the retail industry, what we've been <clears throat> working with the UK government, Northern Ireland executive and the European Commission on is having a certifiable and auditable supply chain. Um, there's no arguments that, you know, the SPS legislation, <clears throat> the standards within that, must be complied with. But the question is, how do you do it? And so if you can have assessment being done in distribution centers or hubs before the goods go across, I mean, we're talking about, you know, a journey here of, you know, goods being loaded into a truck in Cumbernauld in central Scotland and moving over to Belfast within a four hour period. So in that sense, it's very different from the concept behind the EU's SPS legislation, which was about, you know, relatively large amounts of food, all of the same type, arriving by, by ship 
um, into the EU's uh, territory. So I think that many people are of the view that we can find a pragmatic approach about how to comply that will satisfy the EU, that the rules have been met um, and will protect the Northern Ireland consumer uh, and make sure that the same availability and choice is there uh, that people on the GB mainland can experience uh, as well. Nick, just to bring you in on that, would that auditable and certified supply chain that I suppose some people would call it a trusted trader scheme, would that, would that help your uh, members as well? Yeah, if we can go back to the real, to, to what I see as the real heart of the problem here, we, and William's touched on it there, we have adapted a system, uh, you know, that uh, was designed for shifting containers of, uh, of food around the world. And to some extent, no one worried if it got held up in the docks for a day or something, that chance that it's frozen or whatever. Uh, it, this system is not designed for a just-in-time 24-7 food supply chain. It, it just uh, and um, it starts with the fact that you know you have to have sort of vets sort of signing these export health certificates and and vets sort of checking that everything and every can someone on this call explain to me you know when we look back on this why we're asking a fully qualified vet to sign an export health certificate for a cream cake to be exported and what qualification that a vet has to actually to do that this is about an audit trail and we should be able to actually uh you know from one point where the food's been signed off as safe follow it as a put a system in place there's an audit trail all the way through and it should be electronic to make sure that you know sort of food can uh, can be moved around whether it be into northern ireland or even into europe you know so then and that and that's that, that's what we need here otherwise as uh, roger gale intimated earlier small businesses will just have to give up here you know unless we can find a a, a really simplified system that is electronic and isn't uh, incurring the cost of vets you know our members are carrying sort of 200 pound every time they get a vet to sign an export health certificate if it's a small amount of cheese or something like that that's that that's a disproportionate sort of cost it's making it impossible for them we've got to get past that we've got to find a system and I think what Williams touched on there is finding an auditable trail through from a point where this food has already been decided it's safe. We've made sure it's safe, all right, through to the through to the um, uh, supermarket without another load of checks and another load of um, uh, sort of barriers in the way. So, so yeah, we have to find our way through this. Thank you very much, Nick. Much appreciated. I see that Karen has now uh, joined us. Karen Goodburn, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, you're very uh, welcome to this session. Moving on to the next questions, then, uh, Dr. Stephen Farry, please. Uh, thank you, Aidan, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Just to pick up, first of all, on the the, the Northern Ireland uh, issue, um, can I ask, uh, first of all, um, how effective uh, the witnesses feel that the the grace periods have been in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol? And the, the, as a, a corollary to that, um, how fearful are you of what happens whenever those grace periods uh, run out? Uh, and short of a veterinary agreement, um, do you see um, other types of intervention that could manage the uh, the tensions across the, R the RAC? I think that's to, to Nick in the first instance. Uh, th thanks. I, I... I think um, it'd be fair to say the grace periods ha have helped because basically, as I, you've probably got the message by now, I think we, we we have a very complicated, difficult sort of system here. So actually, and certainly had that been implemented right from day one, it would have been sort of chaos. And uh, uh, I wouldn't have been um, wanted to be, I, I don't live in Northern Ireland, I want to be there because I think the food shelves might have been quite empty had it been uh, implemented sort of straight away. So all these grace periods are on the whole are helping. And yeah, I am still extremely sort fearful that even when those grace periods go that we won't necessarily be ready unless we can get some of these other things in place that we've been talking about on this call uh to make this sort of system better otherwise uh you know ju just telling to everyone get ready get used to filling in export health certificates get, get ready to this but you know dealing with this burdensome system i don't think it's you know the bigger players will probably find a way of coping with it uh but as we keep coming back to the smaller sort of players won't so yeah the grace periods have helped and i'm extremely worried about you know when they go that's whether we'll be everyone will be ready uh to to deal with the full fat you know sort of challenges that we've got sort of coming forward 
Does anyone else want to, to chip in on that? Well, I have a more general question as well, Chair. I, I want to throw in, but does anyone else want to pick up on the uh, the grace periods point? Yes, uh, thanks, Stephen. So we, we've had <clears throat> obviously various um, grace periods for, for different products coming in. So, uh, you know, on chilled meat uh, preparations, so the, the famous uh, British sausage and, um, you know, products like that, um, we have an easement until October. Uh, now that was unilaterally extended by the UK government. Mm -hmm. We've also had an easement in terms of um, not having to do export health certificates for that same period. Um, and there's also been, you know, uh, an easement that's been created um, in terms of supermarkets and associated suppliers. And there's about 1,500 to 2,000 companies that have come within that. But I think the key issue is we need to get arrangements about how to comply that produce stability and certainty. Um, that's the key thing. Um, yeah. Our members are telling us, uh, you know, OK, we can keep going like this for a few months, but we really need to know for the medium term mm -hmm. yeah. what's going to be expected of us. That's essential. Yeah. yeah. If, if I could maybe ask um, maybe Emily and Karen to pick up on a more, more general question, just maybe go back to some of the issues at the towards the start of the this uh, evidence session. Um, I, mean, I, I think it's utterly absurd that we have a situation where the EU and the UK are abiding to mutually very high food standards because of different legal regimes. In effect, they're treating each other as they were different far flung parts of the world. Uh, and don't see how that is sustainable. But two particular questions in, in that regard. I mean, um, first of all, how important is the, the gravity theory and trade when we're talking about agri-food? And how disruptive would say a trade deal with Australia or um, Brazil, particularly Emily, given your background, be towards rooting out some form of SPS veterinary agreement with uh, the European Union? How mutually exclusive would those uh, situations tend to be? And probably as a, as a third point, very briefly, is it, is it theoretically possible for the UK to conclude a time limited or um, a veterinary agreement or something that needs to be renewed? So while in the short term, they recognize the reality of alignment, but theoretically keep their options open for doing something else with the rest of the world. There's a, a lot in that question, so I'll try <laughs> and unpack it uh, bit by bit. Um, so first, uh, perhaps on this question of um, the gravity effect um, in, in trade, I mean, and perhaps uh, that's an, an answer to, to, to your earlier question, um, which is specific to what will happen now with Northern Ireland. Um, what, what we're going to see in, is, um, in a way it's predictable, is that the smaller and medium enterprises that we've been mentioning um, based in Northern Ireland will start trading more with the Republic of Ireland rather than with Great Britain, simply because of the, it's not only a compliance cost, it's, it's not only a compliance question, it's a question of the cost as we've been uh, repeating of uh, uh, getting the different certificates um, that, that are necessary, which uh, they will not need to do um, when trading with the Republic of Ireland and the rest of the European Union. Um, and in another way, then that means that for uh, uh, um, uh, suppliers who were in Great Britain to Northern Ireland, they, there will be, uh, again, a diversion of trade, whereby those products will either remain in the domestic market in GB, or will look to uh, further, uh, um, to export further um, um, out of uh, Great Britain and beyond the European Union. Uh, when we're looking at um, the, the basic rules that govern trade, um, we are not allowed to uh, discriminate um, against foreign products, and we're not allowed to discriminate amongst foreign products, as long as they um, indeed uh, uh, respect our food safety standards and other SPS standards, uh, meaning that imports into uh, Great Britain or into the EU respect those legislations. Um, so there is no question of, uh, let's say, having a less safe food come in. The food is either safe 
and it respects the legislation of the country that's importing it or it doesn't and it get rejected it gets rejected at the border so i think that's a, a, a sort of a, a good reminder sometimes as to how to look at these issues now we were looking at the question of uh, for instance uh, australia brazil um what would um uh, the impact of having a trade agreement with australia have um it will have an impact on different sectors obviously depending on the tariff rate quotas which are negotiated unlikely that it will be a free flow of, of, of agricultural trade. Um, um, as much as I'm sure uh, Australia would like to see full liberalization, uh, the most likely is that you will have a tariff rate quota and that those tariff rate quotas will be calculated um, um, by the Department of International Trade to take into consideration the cumulative impact of de different free trade agreements that are going to be negotiated or that the UK is seeking to negotiate. Um, the idea is that generally you'll want to make sure that it doesn't have too much of a uh, an impact um, on um, your domestic production. So uh, it's calculated in terms of the impact on uh, prices in the market, but also the supply in the market. So it doesn't create a shock but it is there actually to create resilience. Now, I think we started today's session uh, with a very um, good reminder that the UK is a food dependent country. It relies on imports uh, for its own food security. It's often a, a word that we're not used to, 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 to bringing up, but food security indeed is, um, is ensured by the fact that we have diversified imports. Uh, so we do need to look at um, our agreements uh, with other countries. And I think uh, Nick mentioned in the case of poultry, well, what uh, British, uh, the, the part of the chicken that the British eat isn't the one necessarily uh, that other countries eat. And that's how we have an international trade that benefits um, different trading partners. So uh, that's really the way of looking at these things. You look at the price impacts on the market volumes and you try and get it to um, to the right point where you have opportunities, but you also give your trading partner opportunities. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Chair. I'm probably out of time. So. Okay. Um, right, so uh, moving on to uh, Claire Hanna, MP, please. Thank you very much and forgive my hand the sun has just arrived in very uh, dramatic form in south belfast and um, i want to stay with with uh, northern ireland and i suppose in the spirit of being handed lemons and wanting to make lemonade i wanted to see if if people um have any views about potential opportunities um for northern ireland uh, and maybe northern ireland producers in areas like agri-food or advanced manufacturing that would come from being uh, at the hinge between the EU and the UK single markets and, and being able to uh, trade fairly cleanly uh, into both of those markets. Um, I wonder maybe, um, Karen, if I could pick up with you, first of all, on that. Uh, firstly, I need to introduce myself and perhaps a totally different sector of rensing you've talked about yet, which may put the cat among the pigeons. So I, I'm director of the Shields Food Association and we represent manufacturers supplying the primarily retailer owned label chill prepared food market in, in the UK. Our largest export market has always been Ireland, the island of Ireland. We supply the major multiples and they're, they're pretty much all in Northern Ireland, but only a couple are in, in the Republic. Uh, so at the moment, uh, I'd say about about 780, something like that, 780 million pounds worth of food we'd expect to export to the island of Ireland, primarily in a year, and a much smaller percentage comparative uh, to the continent, because it just depends on which retailers have a store open on the continent. And nobody's trying to send anything across the channel at the moment in my sector, they've given up. Um, so this is because our shelf lives are very short. We are talking about two to eight days in particular. At the moment, the discovery is you can't really send anything with a shelf life less than three days, their production plus three, because there isn't enough time left on the on the shelf life to sell the product at the other end of the system. This is just going over across the Irish Sea, this is. So the £780 million or so estimated uh, retail market that we're trying to supply uh, would be about 5,000 people's jobs in uh, GB. Uh, we, we have estimated we need uh, about, well, about 24,000, something like that, export health certificates per annum. 
And, and I'll probably, I'm, I might pick up actually on some of those and on, on, on the level of, of friction that they're um, they're applying in, in 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 the next question as well. That's, Okay, fine. So, so just a bit of context. So we're, we're large companies, but there's a lot of a lot of pain. There's a lot of administration. There's a lot of complicated. Well, I, I would say we're dealing with archaic paperwork, Byzantine process, and then Kafkaesque differences of interpretation. Whereas one of my members said to me recently, before sending anything across any patch of water, it was the same as putting it on a truck to Doncaster. So, so that that's where we are. Um, we are so we are retailer own label. Um, so our standards aren't really legal minimum standards. We are producing for Marks and Spencer, Sage, Tesco, and the rest, and and their standards and their uh, dictated sourcing of the components is way beyond anything the government will set as a legal minimum standard. So uh, opening up markets to other other sources doesn't really affect anything because we have specified supplies. We know where everything comes from that we put into a food. So we're, we're very different from being open. I, I would say really, if you're talking about opening up markets uh, to other places, then it would be the wholesale market and people not supplying own label to the retailers in Chill who would be affected and not me. And I don't think that's answered any questions, but at least, at least it's given you some context. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, Emily, is there anything you'd add in terms of opportunities for particular sectors in, in Northern Ireland from having that um, dual access and William had just spoken about stability and certainty that the producers are 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 craving and um, what emphasis do investors put on stability and, and I suppose continuity and believing that the rules um, that are negotiated are going to stay. So I'll try to be brief. I think the, the where you have the most opportunities for producers in Northern Ireland once again is in going to be in British speciality products, which are much uh, um, actually do have quite a lot of uh, demand in the continent. There's a lot of people that would like to have uh, access to these products. And if they can supply the, the European customs union um, and, and European market and consumers there with those products without the extra costs, um, of um, the, the certificates and others, uh, then that obviously provides a competitive advantage to those companies. Um, there, there will be opportunities in a way uh, to, uh, let's say, take from the opportunities of other SMEs that will be located in Great Britain um, for uh, companies located in Northern Ireland that are competing in the same product ranges in those specialty markets. Thanks. And, and uh, picking up on, uh, obviously, we've discussed um, uh, an EU UK SPS and veterinary arrangement, and, and I suppose the likelihood of, of, of the UK choosing that over, over the, the uh, theoretical ability to diverge. But is it possible, um, do, do you think, and maybe William, you could answer this, to quantify um, the number of checks that would eliminate, certainly moving between Northern Ireland and Britain? And I suppose on, on the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, we have heard um, from uh, producers and, and from TSS and others that they think it could be up to 80 to 85 percent of 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 those checks um would would you concur with that assessment um thanks claire yeah well certainly there's scope to eliminate quite uh, a degree of it you know one through having certifiable um compliance schemes uh, but also if there was uh you know a swiss style veterinary agreement you wouldn't need to have ehcs at all on uh non-controlled goods moving from uh gb to ni you wouldn't require to have border control posts um so there would be quite a huge cut in the level of complexity also if the uk was prepared to um you know do a waiver in terms of the union customs code you could do away with the, the requirement for entry summary declarations as well um if we perhaps look <laughs> you know even even further into the future if it decided it wanted to do, um, you know, arrangements on VAT uh, that take some of the burden away that e-commerce retailers and others are experiencing, you could eliminate uh, the requirements on checks for those as well. Really, I think the only things that you would have to have based on uh, an FTA rather than a single market and customs union mechanism would be 
checks on rules of origin um, and origin cer cer certification. Um, it is possible to add deals onto the TCA that could eliminate the vast majority of the rest of the red tape and the other regulatory checks if the political will is there to do so. Thank you. You actually anticipated my my last question, and uh, Nick, I just wanted to see if you had anything to add to that, or there. Um, no, other... no, no. In in yeah. the interest of brevity, I think William sort of you know covered that. Yeah, we see this as a, a you know really key to getting rid of a lot of the sort of checks, you know. But it is about the uh, the politics of this, isn't it, really? And also, um, uh, then in the future, what we decide, what trade trade deals we strike with people, and what uh, product we decide to let into this country. So uh, you know, sort of, and, and what deals you strike but uh, now we we see this as a uh, veterinary agreement as a, as a means of getting rid of a large chunk of the bureaucracy thank, thank you very much chair back to you thank you claire and, and nick you've learned the lesson that i've been learning for this past few years never go after william bain he steals all the good lines um <laughs> folks um at the end i'm just going to give you the heads up so at the end i'm going to ask you um the top three concerns from now until the end of the year and your top three recommendations for uh, this commission. I just want to give you a bit of a heads up um, so you can start thinking about that now while, while other people are, are talking. However, uh, we go on with our questions and we are going to uh, talk about practical recommendations. Um, we're going to Peter Norris and then Roger Gale MP will ask a follow up on this. Apologies, I was on mute. I'd like to ask um, <coughs> the, the witnesses um, if the UK should lower the level of regulation on food production <coughs> as part of its response to the, the, the changes in our trading relationships. Perhaps I could start with Karen. Um, the answer is no. And as I explained, it we're producing foods for the major multiples who set the standards, so it's nothing to do with what the government says. So the, there's a basic legal minimum standard, which is way below anything that the, the retail customers are demanding of my members to put in chill prepared foods. So that's, it would, it can't, there's not, there's not really um, a, a great deal of competition in chill beyond the major multiples because they dominate this market. So I'm talking about you know, pizza, soup, sauces, dips, dressings, pies, pastries, sandwiches, salads, ready meals, meal accompaniments, desserts and cakes, everything you find in the lovely chilled aisle. And, and that really only will dominate that market in the UK. So unless the retailers have a change of policy, which I can't see because it's all about brand protection and confidence and, and uh, consumers wanting to buy a good standard product again and again, then, then I, I don't, don't see anything changing. The issue will come if, if something comes in through uh, another part of the, the market, perhaps it's wholesale, it goes out to some of the businesses that aren't in that, that retail owned label loop, for example, and something goes wrong, the media gets hold of that and then says it's a problem with all of that category of foods. And that's where that's where we work in trying to make sure that sort of backwash doesn't hit us and, and demanding high standards across the board, wherever we can in lobbying. Thanks, Karen. Nick, do you want to express a different view? Uh, I know I totally agree actually no it, this isn't about actually sort of lowering our level of regulation uh, our uh, you know our plea would be actually uh, you know sort of making the regulatory enforcement and controls and, and the bureaucracy that goes with it better and smarter and more sort of fit for modern days of purpose really but uh, certainly no we, we're certainly not in favor of lowering any um any standards in any shape or form would either of the other witnesses disagree? No, not, not entirely disagree. What I would say is simply what is a lower standard um, is obviously the first question I think that needs to be asked here. And, and perhaps a reminder that free trade agreements do not change domestic regulation uh, relating to the way that we produce our food. Um, uh, again, food needs to be safe in order to be imported into uh, in, into the UK. What what it would do, though, is that if there is a change in the UK's legislation on a number of uh, uh, creating new flexibilities, for instance, on the hygiene of products or or others, what would that that would create more friction with the European Union, more checks, 
and uh, uh, less incentive to get any kind of veterinary equivalence agreement or decision that that would certainly get in the way. Yes, I'd, I'd agree with that and build on on Emily's response there. I mean, it's interesting that New Zealand is in CPTPP, uh, but nevertheless still has an equivalence relationship with the European Union as far as SPS is concerned. So it is possible to have high standards, good levels of reg regulation um, and still be able to make trade agreements with selected trade partners. Um, now, of course, um, in relation to the US, that's a whole different can of worms altogether. All <clears throat> um, but I think it's important to reflect upon the fact that the legal baseline um, in the TCA is the, uh, the WTO's SPS agreement. And it's open to the parties to build upon that, but certainly not go below those standards uh, or that agreement in terms of the baseline. Thanks very much. Roger, would you like to follow up on the? I, my, excuse me, my major concern um, has always been and remains um, the standards issue. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that there is a resistance to lowering standards, apparently across the piece. But I'm more concerned about raising standards. Um, we historically have admitted into the United Kingdom foodstuffs produced under circumstances that would never be permitted, uh, in, un, under conditions that would never be permitted in the United Kingdom. And one of the glories of leaving the European Union was going to be that we would be able to exclude product um, of that kind to the advantage of our own industries. Now, you're all in the food business. I don't know who to go to first, really. Well, let's. Um, let's try Emily, Emily first uh, with, the, with the agricultural hat on and, and see what you think about not just maintaining standards but actually raising them. Well, once again, if you if the, the UK would like to introduce uh, new legislation governing food safety or, or other um, uh, means of uh, producing food, um, it's absolutely in in the independence now of the UK to do so. Um, and all imports will have to comply with the sanitary and phytosanitary measures which are put into place by the UK. But we need to keep in mind, once again, that any divergence of standards, even if it's raised, it's a change of rules. Um, any divergence in the regulations with the European Union create trade friction. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, any other takers on this? I, I want to come back on this but with Emily, but um, William, have yeah, you got so, Sorry, can I, or does... Okay, fine. Can I, uh, so, so, so if you will, look, I, I think, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that what, what do people define as, uh, as standards, you know, sort of what, 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 what is this about? There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a massive amount of confusion uh, uh, about it. And, um, uh, you know, and I think we have to uh, ha have a debate in this country as, as to what we, what we mean by that before we, uh, you know, so when, when we sort of change things, when we decide things about other methods of production. Uh, because, uh, you know, we talk to a lot of other countries around the world and they, they would heavily defend their, um, uh, <coughs> their, their, their sort of how they do things and why they do things in a particular way. Uh, you know, so I think we've got to be sort of very sort of clear on 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 what and why we're doing things. And I suppose one of the this leads to sort of one of the things I sort of feel very strongly about. Now we're in the uh, big wide world. I don't see that we've got anything, and I don't see where the plan is in place in the UK to replace the U <coughs> the, the um, European Food Standards Authority. Uh, <clears throat> now, if we want to actually start uh, make, making and, and sort of changing the rules and sort of changing our standards and things like that, we need a world class body in this country that can provide the evidence uh, and provide the science to deliver that. Uh, now, my impression at the moment is that the government have just said, oh, they're going to hand all that to the uh, Food Standards Agency in this country. Those A's are different. 
the the FSA is an authority. It is a standalone body that actually you know, can make independent um, uh, sort of de decisions and, and recommendations. Whereas the Food Standards Agency, as well as uh, um, having some element of authority, is also a police force. So you effectively, if you hand it all to that organisation, you effectively are asking the FSA to mark their own homework. Uh, you know, so then, and um, forgive me for using a phrase that politically has been used quite a bit today. Um, but you know, I, I think if we before we actually start, uh, you know. Um, uh, you, you know, so sort of just changing our standards and things like that. I think we need to put a body in place that actually can make some good, sound, evidence-based, scientific-based uh, decisions and recommendations before we go down that path. So, Nick, can I be absolutely clear? Um, it, it sounds as though you're recommending yet another quanker. We've got. I, I recommend that actually we, we take everything we've got at the moment and actually say, right, we've got a chance to start from scratch here. We've gone out into the big wide world. Let's actually put something together that's fit for purpose. What we've got is if we carry on like we are, we've got a plethora of agencies involved in all these things. And that's part of the problem with our the export health of, uh, uh, export system at the moment, that we've got loads of agencies involved in this. Let's take the time to actually get ourselves and, and you know get this lean and mean so that it's fit for purpose. For one, then we can be competitive when we go out into the wide, big wide world, and then we can make solid decisions about what we're going to, what our free trade agreements are going to look like, and what we're going to allow to come into this country and what we're not. But at the moment, I think we've just got a plethora of agencies. Uh, you know, sort of an, an, a nine. I, I'm not suggesting we add another one. I'm suggesting we go through the whole lot and actually rationalise them. I, I think, Sir Roger, a point that's important to put before the, the commissioners today is that increasingly in terms of food, much of the standard setting is being done globally uh, through codex. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't, you know, I think have the impression that everything is being done differently in Mercosur from, you know, what's happening in, in Europe. Um, you know, codex is, I think, going to become more important as we see trade flows increase, hopefully once the uh, pandemic has, has abated somewhat. Uh, in terms of what the UK could decide to do, so you know, if it decides not to take the advice that many of us have been giving to this committee today and decides on a divergence model, of course it could decide to, you know, um, take a different stance on the use of pesticides, you know, glyphosate um it could decide to to have all sorts of, of 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 different policies from that followed by the eu it could choose to dispense entirely with the precautionary principle absolutely there's nothing in the tca that builds against that but that has two implications one friction between gb and, and ni increases and the amount of checks on retailers and others increases and the cost of that for business and consumers increases and secondly, in terms of goods we export from Britain to the EU, you also have that increase. So sovereignty and divergence has a cost. And I think it would be appropriate if in any plan there was to diverge, that there is a proper impact assessment about what the costs and opportunities might be of that divergence, but what the re resultant costs would be to business and consumers of doing that divergence as well. William, you'll forgive me for saying that I find that immensely depressing because it sounds rather as though we were sold a pup. Basically, um, the whole, uh, well, one, not the whole, of course, but, but one of the um, major factors that was sold as being the advantage of leaving the European Union was that we could actually raise, for example, our animal welfare standards and also um, pay attention to some of the ingredients that are used in agriculture. What you're actually saying, as I understand it, is that and what, and what Emily said is that if you diverge, that's a change, even if it's a change for the better. So that puts a spanner in the works. And in any event, if you change at all, um, then that's going to put a spanner in the works because you're not agreeing with all the people you're trying to do business with. So where is the progress going to be? If Nick's new body was able was to be created, would it have any room for manoeuvre? So Roger, I think we're going to have to move on at this stage. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I share your concerns. Uh, Dr. Jeff Mackey, please. 
Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, since the TCA was signed, we have seen changes. Um, the rules on UK inward import checks and multi-ingredient products come to mind. I wonder, would our experts like to share, our, share their thoughts on the impact of these and indeed on this transparency for us in business to understand? Uh, Karen, could I start with you and also mention that before you joined us, there was a conversation about auditable trails rather than barriers as a starting point. Okay, that's interesting because uh, all, all of the components are chill prepared foods that they're, they're fully traceable. For example, on a bag of salad, we can go back to the corner of the field from which the leaf was harvested and what date, what the weather was like and everything that it experienced in terms of uh, horticulture and good agricultural practice up to that point and then good agricultural practice. So we've got full traceability is not an issue. The trouble is um, that the actual export health certificates, and I'm not sure whether you've seen them, I'm happy to share the composite products one, which is the focus of my life at the moment, and that covers um, the vast majority of our products. They're, the certificates are not actually designed to be completed for the foods that are being made. So there is a two centimetre little dashed line where we're supposed to put in all the all the sources of all the cheese and the milk and the butter in a ready meal and it doesn't fit. And you end up with this massive uh, schedule of su supplementary information, which can be 50 pages long. And you end up with a thousand pages of, of uh, paper on the lorry. So, so the whole thing, whole thing there is just uh, completely unwieldy. Um, and, and when we start to apply these sort of things on the import checks for coming into the UK, into GB rather from the EU, I don't think our continental cousins are going to know what's hitting hit them. So there'll be an impact then on what's going to be coming into the country. And I've already been told by um, so the Belgian association that a couple of their major members aren't even going to try to send their food here anymore coming the 1st of October. So I'm sort of veering off a bit. But uh, the 21st of April was a big date. And for my sector, we already had about 23,000, we estimated export health certificates required to shift any, any food to the EU. And then another 8,500 uh, EHCs are now expected because of the extension of scope of, of, the, of the, um, the whole composite certificate thing, which now anything with even a sort of, I like to say a molecule of dairy, um, now requires an export health certificate if there's any plant material and it's chilled. So we've got all those sort of things in there. So whether that's answered your question or not, but it's, it's, we're dealing with a very different context from, from meat or fish or something. When it's melting components or chilled, um, the traceability is all there, but you can't fit it on the certificate. And that's what the issue is. So my people end up with a 40 column spreadsheet with 900 rows with all the data in it. And then they've got to put that on a, a form in the two centimetre dot, dotted line. No, I, th I think the interpretation is interesting. And certainly when you mention a drop of dairy, I can also bring in my access to cheese and onion crisps of a certain variety, which I'll not discuss here. Um, <laughs> William, just moving on for a second. Uh, William, you mentioned that we knew what we'd signed up to, but we're talking about ongoing changes. Any comment on the impacts? Well, <clears throat> I mean, if you remember the <clears throat> third iteration of the protocol, that which was eventually agreed uh, between the UK government and the commission and which got through the UK parliament, um, you know, that was clear in October, 2019. Um, so, you know, we've had quite a bit of time to read it and understand it and understand what's going to be, be required. And, you know, business and, and trade groups were on top of it very quickly uh, because we did see what was uh, going to be the realities of, of a regulatory and customs border in, in the Irish Sea. Um, <clears throat> I think the key asks we would have now is that we know there is a really involved work stream going on uh, between the UK government and the Commission to break down the SPS checks. We've, we've talked about it in general today, but to break them down into the different categories and to break it down into the individual products and processes and the pinch points within each of those. So we know that that work stream is underway. Uh, the roadmap which the UK government submitted to Brussels uh, is very welcome in that, that respect. We still think there are some, you know, philosophical differences about, you know, is it a roadmap or is it a timetable for compliance? But I think we can overcome those. 
But the key thing is to engage with business at every turn so that things are done with business and not to business. That I think was one of the errors which was made in the early part of um, securing compliance with the, with the protocol, not enough business engagement. It has been remedied now, but we need to see that through right to the end of this process till we get to a stable set of conditions, which mean that you know we're not going to face um, the investment instabilities, we're not going to face uh, you know changes in what's required of retailers and others. And also importantly, um, that the protocol can you know, have some stability in terms of how it's perceived in Northern Ireland as well, which is a really critical point. Um, we're all aware of the imminence of, you know, the elections, obviously, but also the vote in Stormont in 2024 on the protocol as well. Thank you very much. Uh, just to finish, family of my we're talking about ongoing changes in the last two or three sentences. Would you like to suggest any other changes we will or should have to help us? Um, sorry, was, 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 was that to me, Jeff? I, I didn't sorry, that was directed at Emily. I beg your pardon. Emily, I'll, I, it was the question of what other changes we should be aiming for, since it's obviously an open feast. Well, I mean, there, there are a couple of, uh, of points here, but um, perhaps to an earlier question, which was um, the one about being able to raise, you know, legislation on animal welfare, for instance. Um, I think we need to distinguish things. The way things are produced within the UK, for instance, um, an animal welfare legislation that could become stricter um, is, uh, is absolutely permissible and would have very little impact on, on trade because the process and production method isn't part of the SPS measure in the way that we, um, in terms of import requirements. So just to come back to that earlier point, um, Perhaps I'll, I'll leave the, the rest of this question to somebody else. Thank you. That would be also appreciated because I also have to leave it there. Back to you, Chair, please. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, Paul Bloomfield, MP, please. Thanks very much, Aidan. Um, I guess this is quite a difficult question because it depends very heavily on kind of William's point about what road the UK chooses to follow. But uh, can, let's assume that uh, things go sort of as they are at the moment without significant new divergence um, or without basic significant change. I, I'm concerned about the debate that we've had over the early years, post, early months post transition, which has been, are we facing teething problems uh, or have we got a long term difficulty. We saw some fairly dramatic uh, figures on UK exports to the EU in the first month, which were, 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 were kind of dismissed by many as teething problems. Those figures changed um, in February. Um, what sense do you have of how far UK exports to the EU are going to return to something closer to normal? And what does closer to normal look like and when might that happen um, perhaps if we could start with emily well um very um very good question there um what is normal i mean <laughs> If, if we've learned anything with this pandemic is that there is no return to a normal. Um, and, and I think that probably we could use that same analogy to the, the situation uh, with the, the UK's exit from the EU. From the moment that you're no longer part of the customs union, it changes the rules of the game. There will be no return unless you re-enter the customs union. There is no return to that normality. That normality no longer exists. Your companies are no longer um, uh, trading, uh, they're doing international trade, they're exporting to the EU, and um, obviously that will have um, long-term impacts. There are some companies that will stop um, exporting to the European Union and will diversify. Others might change, for instance, their range of products. But one thing that we can we should all keep in mind is that this will have long-term ramifications 
um, and will change uh, quite sensitively. Um, I, I would imagine also uh, availability within the domestic market within the UK of uh, food produce. So um, perhaps um, perhaps uh, British will be eating more seafood and and less beef. I guess can I just briefly follow up on that, Emily, and then perhaps move to others. Um, yeah, normal's a difficult word, clearly, and even more so um, in the middle of a global plague. Um, but um, I guess, what, what, where do you think we're going to stand in a year's time, if nothing significant changes, in terms of the levels of exports as they were um, pre-departure uh, pre from the transition, I guess pre-COVID? Again, uh, it's very difficult to, it to uh, very difficult to measure um, effectively. But I mean, we will. I, I doubt you will have a return back to to pre um, pre pandemic trade um, uh, levels with the European Union. The, the question now becomes: is where uh, your companies start seizing opportunities? Do they look further afield? Do they find uh, new uh, supply chains? Um, it's very difficult uh, to uh, preempt in a way because it's not companies that trade, it's not countries that trade, it's actually companies and they're the ones that are going to have to take now the, the, the tough decisions as to stopping ranges or, um, or, or perhaps uh, again uh, moving uh, changing the way that they produce in order to cater perhaps to different markets. So, but one thing I think we can uh, feel quite assured is that it will not come back to where it was. And how, th thanks very much, Emily. If I could open it up by, um, and I'm conscious of time, uh, but uh, by asking how that might change across sectors. And perhaps I could start with uh, Karen, do you have a, a, a different perspective? At the moment, we're about 50% down on export, which is just going across any patch of water. And when the when the rules on the GB Northern Ireland export health certificates come in some point next year for the my sector, it may even be as late as October, as I've seen, then there'll be another huge hit, which people are extremely anxious about. So uh, we have a permanent situation here, unless something radical changes, we rejoin the customs union or, or there's some veterinary thing that gets rid of all this certification, um, then that, I, it's difficult for anyone to see any change because the cost of doing this is a very large proportion of what the previous profit was. So that's not sustainable in the long term. And so companies, well, I, even last year I had a call from a company in Northern Ireland I never heard of who, who knew you see what was going to happen on the paperwork side if there was no deal which is basically what we got um so he wanted to set up and, and take all the all, all the supply ch chain away from the stuff that was being imported from from gb so you know good for him he saw the opportunity and you can see more of that and companies then saying well let's set up say on the island of ireland so we can supply the whole of ireland through the major multiples that that would be a sort of longer longer medium term approach um and the 21st of April, the new certification just added a greater burden. And it's, it's really got to think about how, how much effort, how much is this costing to supply quite a minor market for us? You know, 5%, 8, 6, 7%, 8%. And really, what's the long term consequences of that? And what's is sustainability in all respects is what I'd say there. It's the issue. Mm. Yeah, I guess that last question is one that lots of SMEs are asking across all sectors. But I wonder, um, Nick, William, do you have any quick observations before we move on? Uh, uh, yeah, if I can come in. I mean, we surveyed our members uh, it's about three, 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 four weeks ago and, and sort of came, came out with a sort of, uh, a sort of report. We're probably running at about um, uh, 70, 75 sort of percent of what we were sort of doing pre um, uh, before the year. But that misses a point. Um, it's the added value that's being sort of lost here because we're having to step out of a, um, <clears throat> you, you know, sort of that uh, sort of a, a 24 seven sort of supply chain. So for instance, what I mean there is our members and uh, Emily quite right identified, this is about individual companies. So the bigger companies can play a better game here. So the bigger companies, instead of actually cutting up some meat in this country and exporting them, are sending carcasses and cutting up abroad. So effectively you've exported, you know, that added value, you've exported those 
jobs and things like that. So it's not as simple as just looking at the sort of tonnages. It's the sort of the, the, the value that's being lost as well, really, you need to take into account. But I agree with Emily. I and, and particularly a lot will hinge on whether we can sort groupage out. We started having some good uh, discussions with DEFRA about how we sort of get groupies working and going forward. But uh, uh, and that will be critical as to bringing some of the sort of smaller players into play. But uh, it's uh, yes, I, I agree with you. I don't see and I don't think we should ever expect it going back to, uh, you know, sort of pre, um, you know, the 1st of January this last year. Okay. Paul, if you don't mind, uh, I need to move on, unfortunately. Of course, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, witnesses, I, I know that you have a hard stop at, at 12, uh, Karen, um, so 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 thank you. Um, the rest of you, due to your wonderful answers and my terrible chairing, um, it, we're going to run over by about five minutes, so please uh, apologise, uh, accept the apology if you don't mind uh, uh, staying on for another uh, couple of quick uh, minutes, as there are just a couple more uh, important questions to ask. And with that, I will go to Andrew Ballheimer, please. Thanks very much, Chair, um, and thank you to each of the witnesses. Um, I've just got a quick question. You know, so we've obviously heard about the, the, um, all the challenges and the frictions that are actually happening in practice. Um, you know, as you look at the TCA, um, is there a reduction in the checks that on you know import and export of food and drink that help? Yeah, as against if we didn't have you know, a Brexit agreement, is it? You know, is there any? Upside in practice of you know having the TCA in place as against you know if we didn't if we were in the, the states and importing and exporting from there. Emily, do you want to start? So um, the the TCA does not include um, uh, provisions on frequency of physical checks. So in that regard, we are on very much a basic third country uh, level in terms of the frequency of checks. So that will be. 100% um, checks at the border control post for live animals, um, for minced meat or eggs, um, for human consumption, milk for human consumption, you'll have one out of three of the consignments that will be checked. And then it can go all the way down, um, for instance, to 15% uh, for hatching eggs or honey for instance. Uh, those are pretty standard in terms of frequency of physical checks. Obviously, if there is uh, a consignment where there is a problem, uh, and the, the, these, these things happen every day, I think it's very important to remind ourselves that, you know, um, analyses and lab checks um, at the border, there's some produce will be, um, uh, will be um, rejected. Um, if there are too many rejections uh, from a specific supplier, then uh, that will increase the frequency of checks on that specific product. Um, that's a natural thing to do to keep uh, the food that we consume safe. Thank you. Karen, I don't know if you have a moment still. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to hang around. But um, I Thank don't you. really have any comment on this because I'm not, we don't, we, we, we're not doing any chill food with the USA. <laughs> it's just, you can't, you can't do two to eight days with that. So I can't really comment on that. But the, this has gone from zero to massive for us, generally. Yeah, yeah. There was a story about, the, you know, about the, all the information in the spreadsheet of 900 items was illuminating, frankly, for all of us, I think. Um, Nick? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, we like to dwell on the point. We're, we're now a third country outside Europe, you know, and, and we're being treated exactly the same. Uh, our challenge, as I've alluded to a number of times, is we're trying to disentangle a, a just-in-time 24-7 supply chain uh, uh, sort of another country. So, so we're feeling the pain and, the, the, you know, because we're trying to do that. But, um, yeah, we're a third country, you know, we're, to my, as far as I can see, we're being treated by Europe exactly the same as, as any other country around the world. So. William? And then yes, uh, as I said in reply to an earlier question, I mean, the basis of the SPS chapter in the TCA is the WTO's SPS oh. agreement. So we are trading on WTO terms in terms of food regulation. Um, uh, as I say, the debate is whether, you know, we're happy to live with that as a, uh, as a, as a country um, or whether we want to seek some improvements. And I think you are seeing a widespread consensus around the food and drink industry um, that within the new architecture that the newly ratified agreement creates through the Partnership Council, the Trade Committee, the Sectoral Committees, the Civic Society and Business Engagement, uh, which I think is a very important part of the TCA. 
we have some opportunities to um, make that point uh, and to improve the agreement, even in the medium term, without waiting for that five year review in 2026. Thank you. Aidan? Thank you, Andrew. Um, lastly, it's that question for me, that homework question that I said to you uh, earlier on. Um, and uh, I'm looking for the two or three things that are your biggest concerns uh, between now and, and the end of the year when this commission will uh, will, will finalise its report. Uh, and also the, the two or three things that you think that this commission uh, should recommend or should, should look for. Um, and I'm going to go uh, William, then Emily, then Nick, then Karen, please. Thanks, Hayden. <laughs> nice, nice to go first. Sort of less time to come up with them, but anyway, uh, we've been coming up with these for months. Um, I think the, the 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 key concern is that um, suppliers in the EU are not sufficiently ready for the inbound border controls uh, starting in October. As you know, uh, products of animal origin will have to be pre-notified uh, as they come into GB from the EU starting on the first of October. Um, I think the second concern is that, um, you know, this work stream that we've talked about between the UK government and the Commission doesn't yield the results that we need by early autumn and that we're in this position again about whether easements need to be extended and how they're done. Are they done unilaterally or done bilaterally? So really Northern Ireland, I would say, remains the principal concern. And the third concern I would say we would have is just of, in relation to that, uh, the political instability. We are hoping that the political climate does not get worse in Northern Ireland uh, to allow the protocol to be applied in the way that we want agreed between both sides, the Northern Ireland executive and business. And your recommendations? Top recommendations. Um, uh, one, to get that auditable and verifiable supply chain solution for Northern Ireland, that will really help in terms of getting food across. So that's priority number one. Um, priority number two, uh, we need to have a veterinary agreement. Priority three, we need to have a structured discussion and engagement between business, the UK government and the EU institutions about how we can build upon the agreement uh, to have less friction in our trade. That's quite the Christmas list there, William. Uh, Emily? So, considering that I'm not representing any specific uh, interest uh, uh, in this debate, I will concur with William's uh, concerns and go straight to the recommendations, if that's okay, Chair. Um, one of the most, uh, the, one of the quick things that could be done is getting all these certificates we've been mentioning today now into an electronic system. Um, it, it, in the TCA, it says that we should endeavor to promote the electronic certifications. This is pretty basic. Um, that could be done very quickly and it would already provide um, um, some support to companies. Uh, another uh, point I think is that we need to very quickly identify what are the low hanging fruit. Um, instead of looking at uh, the negotiation of a again, a, a big veterinary equivalency agreement. What are the low hanging fruit, the things that can be sorted straight away that are product specific, that are sector specific, and that we can actually get done um, through an exchange of letters. Um, and um, I would also say now that we are diverging, because I think that that is something um, that um, uh, we need to keep in mind, the regulations of the UK and the EU are diverging as the EU continues to take decisions and the UK is going to start uh, bringing in regulation of its own that will affect trade. We need to have better means uh, of monitoring regulatory changes of the EU as they will not only impact um, uh, exports from GB to EU, but more importantly, they will govern the rules of production in Northern Ireland. Um, and then finally, we need to educate SMEs on um, the processes and the mechanisms that we can put into place to make them better exporters. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Nick? Uh, thank you, yes. I, and uh, I will circulate to the chairman. Uh, funny enough, we, we, we produced a report and it has three recommendations at the end. So I'll circulate to you and if you can pass that around the sort of commission if they haven't connected with it already. But uh, if I can go to a real short term one and then that, that, I, sort of, that, that I, I think really needs addressing straight away is we still getting huge variation in terms of what the vets uh, who are signing these health certificates, their interpretation of what they've got to do. Um, I, it, wouldn't be, it would be unfair to say 
okay, they, they appear to be a rule, <coughs> rule unto themselves, but the more vets that come into the system, we're increasingly having problems uh, with them actually making their own decisions about what these, what the guidance notes will say. And the introduction of, uh, our, or the lowering of the uh, language sort of standards to vets coming into the country that's now being proposed isn't gonna help that. So that's an immediately short-term concern of mine. Uh, in terms of actually the three recommendations, we need to go through root and branch and try and simplify this system, the sort of inspection and certification and some other countries in Europe have got much slicker and, and better systems than we've got. Electric documentation, I uh, agree with Emily, this is utterly ridiculous when messing around with, you know, sheets of paper sort of being, uh, or, you know, filefuls of paper being sort of tracked all over the country it's utterly ridiculous and yes and the, and the vet then the veterinary agreement and i agree with emily as well actually if you try and bite this off in one big sort of chunk it will be so sort of challenging but if we could uh, sort of pick it you know pick it off piece around what uh, so some sort of veterinary agreements could do to try and ease some of the critical sort of points here particularly around you know products of animal origin i think would be a really good sort of starting point so thank you thank you very much nick and lastly karen well, yeah, all of all of the above. Um, the concerns, basically, the system isn't fit for purpose. It's not designed for just in time, short shelf life, chill prepared foods. It, it's just it isn't designed for it. It's designed for stuff to come in ambient from a slow boat from China. Mind you, they have an agreement with you anyway. So so the whole thing is not not fit for purpose for the, the extent and type of trade that GB does with uh, EU and NI, but certainly in, in my chill prepared food, very short shelf life. Uh, so that's the first problem. Uh, the vets, uh, we've got some figures from the APHA, which I had in a session this morning, which is why I'm late. Uh, 89,000 export health certificates have been issued this year, compared with 806 this period last year. And that was pre COVID up to the end of March. There wasn't anything. So it's a 110 fold increase in export health certificates. Each one needs to be signed by a vet. So if you take 89,000 certs and say it's a couple of hours each, for me it's three or four hours because it's so complex, then it comes out of seven and a half thousand days so far this year spent by vets signing certificates. That's that's 24 hour days, not eight hour days. So it's 21,000 eight hour days. And there aren't that many vets in the country. So then it comes back to what Nick's saying, where are these vets coming from? And dragging people in. Um, and then it brings me up to one of my recommendations because vets don't know anything about food necessarily or where it comes from or how things are made and therefore query everything because they can lose their jobs if they do it wrong. Uh, third issue then, EU GB imports. Uh, it, it will be ingredients for me, uh, for my industry. Um, and that, that's really con of concern. I flagged it with our European Federation, but like I said, the Belgians said they probably won't even try on our stuff. Um, it's a real, really big issue. Um, so on the recommendations, we need to simplify and digitise the whole thing. The EHCs are just part of it because I've got my 900, 940 column spreadsheets behind that. How do you pull that out? People are copying and pasting from Excel at the moment. That can't go on. So support health attestations data is massive and that's done on a monthly basis. We need to continue that. We need to digitise the composite products decision tree because it looks like uh, some hellish snakes and ladders diagram. You can't even see it on A3 printout. There's so much going on. Need to digitise that so people can click through and they can choose their search. So that whole thing is digitisation. Um, we need to get rid of this 24 hour pre notification. At the moment, our foods are being made certified and they sit on the lorry until that till they can get on the ferry. So they're losing a day shelf life sitting on the lorry with the with the compressor going and being kept cold. The law does allow for four hours pre notification, which would be much better and they ought to be something in between. Um, so that lo we're losing shelf life by food being made sitting on the lorry because it didn't exist the day before it was ordered. It's made to order. The third bit, when you sort out the vets, support the vets so they understand food production, supply and distribution, and they're confident about it because they can be struck off if they don't do things correctly. So that adds fear, especially to a young vet and may lose their entire future just for filling in the form incorrectly. We'd lose a quarter of a million pounds worth of food on, on a truck, but they'd lose their future. And that would actually help us possibly deal with some of the complexity of groupage if they didn't if they understand it better and didn't ask questions about all the background data with my 900 line spreadsheet and the rest of it and start digging around at that when they're supposed to be signing off a form and completing it. That's uh, that's pretty stark. Um, what all of you have said today, um, I have a few thank yous to do. Firstly, to our, our, our witnesses, um, 
thank you for being frank and, and for being engaging. Uh, thank you, Emily. Thank you, William. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, uh, Karen. There's a lot to think about there. Um, there's a lot that has been raised uh, as far as red flags and as far as uh, recommendations. So genuinely, um, you have made a difference. Um, I also need to thank our secretariat, um, uh, the rest of the commissioners, and of course, uh, David Hannock for the wonderful um, briefing that he provided us before uh, this, uh, this, this, this meeting. Uh, just a reminder um, to both commissioners and uh, those who are watching at home, our next session will be on the 13th of May, and that will be based on financial services and ably chaired by Peter Norris. Uh, but I think that for our live session is finished. Thank you very much for your time.